Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Grim Dark History Podcast. My name is Jeremy Agnew. If you're not familiar with the podcast, what we do here is explore the intersection between history and popular fiction. We go into deep dives, the nitty gritty details of people, places, historical times that show up in a lot of popular fiction. For season one, we've been focusing on specifically one piece of fiction. That's the kind of world and universe of the Warhammer 40,000 fictional universe. In that world, there is a character who is an immortal human who pops in and out of our ancient history. And we've been exploring all the different times and places and people that this fictional character has been. In episode one of the series, we dropped a quote from the book that heavily suggested that he was the figure, historical figure of Jesus of Nazareth. And so why we've been doing this last few series has been exploring the historical times and place of Jesus of Nazareth. And as I was doing my research into this timeline, getting at what was life really like, I had to keep going backwards in time to get at the root of the causes and effects of what brought about Jesus of Nazareth and the Christianity movement amongst many other things that were happening. And while I was doing that research, I also came across somebody who was alive during the life of Jesus of Nazareth, a first-hand account of somebody who lived through the Roman destruction of Jerusalem, the first Jewish-Roman revolt war that happened 30 years after Jesus died. And I was fascinated by the history that he wrote down, so I decided to, instead of focus the episode just on Jesus of Nazareth, was to focus the episode on that, And through the course of telling that history, we naturally arrive at the life and period, or pardon me, the time period of Jesus of Nazareth, which is actually one of the things that leads up and one of one of the dominoes that has to fall in order to cause the Roman Jewish revolt war that happened 30 years after his death. So this is episode three in what will be a four-part series. I thought I was going to fit it all into three episodes, but as I got to recording this episode, I realized there was a, a lot more detail that I needed to cover here, and I didn't want to shortchange the Jewish-Roman revol- revolt and leave just a few minutes for that. So we're going to do one whole episode just on that. This episode is going to cover the time period from the rise of Jesus of Nazareth to the start of the Roman Jewish revolt. So we'll be covering roughly from uh, Common Era 25 to Common Era 66, 64, right around that time. We're not going to be talking a lot about Jesus of Nazareth. We will be talking about the culture and world that he existed in and the pressures and forces on society between Romans and Judeans, between Judeans and Samaritans, between uh, Judeans and and Jews within Jerusalem, all these things and how they play off and ignite the fuse that causes the Jewish-Roman revolt. So I I hope you enjoy this episode. If you do, uh, feel free to shoot me an email. I am at grimdarkhistory at gmail.com. Let me know what you think of the episode or any of my previous episodes. We're not too far away from Season 2. I'll be starting my research for that soon after I finish... Uh, recording my uh, final episode in this series. I'm also on YouTube. You can find my channel on YouTube at Grimdark History. Uh, If you're not into the long-form podcasts, I've taken a couple of these episodes as an experiment 
and chop them up into smaller little five to ten minute um, vignettes of certain snaps or bite-sized chunks of the episode to cover one little teeny subtopic. So if that interests you, check out the channel, those little clips. It's called Grimdark History Clips. They're animated. Maybe you find that entertaining. Or maybe you're happy just listening to the podcast, which is fine for me. If you enjoy my podcast and you enjoy history, I've been successful at my goal. And I hope you're happy. I hope you're entertained by this episode. And one of the things I realize I don't really talk about much and some people may find interesting is what are the books that I'm even reading when I, in order to get my research for these episodes. So I'm going to talk to you just for a couple of minutes about the different books that I've read as part of the research for this entire series. And if you're interested, you can pick those books up or not, whatever, it's up to you. But I thought maybe you might be interested in these and you can read along too if you'd like to. All right, so we'll talk about my uh, sources, the books that I've read, and then we'll dive right into the episode. If you're interested in what my sources are for this episode, I have uh, four main sources that I'm drawing my information from and at times quoting from. My first two sources are The Antiquity of the Jews and The Wars of the Jews. That's by historian Flavius Josephus, and I'll be talking a bit about him, actually quite a bit about him, uh, towards the end of this episode. To help understand Roman perspectives, uh, Roman thinking, you know, Roman events in relation to the lead up to the causes of the Roman Jewish War, I drew across two different books. Uh, the first one is Pax, that is written by historian and author Tom Holland who also uh, runs or co-hosts the Rest is History podcast. And it's a very entertaining podcast. I recommend uh, you check that out if you're looking for uh, history podcasts that have uh, cover a wide range of topics. My other book that I drew from to help understand Roman perspectives and history leading up to this a bit is SPQR, A History of Ancient Rome. That's by historian and author Mary Beard. Between the two of these books, uh, SPQR and PAX, I would actually recommend SPQR by Mary Beard. It's a much more engaging read from my perspective, and uh, it covered a lot more history. PAX is not written quite as well, but it is very approachable. Uh, you don't need any sort of history degree to pick up Pax and uh, kind of dive right in. It's a narrative story. It's just not written quite the best. Um, Mary Beard's SPQR, uh, much better written. It's a little bit less of the narrative kind of story-like history, so it might be not quite as approachable as uh, Pax was. But those are my two Roman books that I that I drew from for this podcast series. And if you're interested, definitely I would recommend picking these books up to learn more uh, about this time period, but also the time periods before and after this, and because it's very interesting history, especially SPQR, because it talks quite at length about the things that interest me, and that's life and society and what people were like in Rome. Pax is more of a history story of people and individual activities, whereas SPQR is more about what was life like. So just to give you an idea of what the, the two books are like. We're going to start our story today somewhere in the realm of 30 Common Era. And if you haven't yet 
I really strongly encourage you to go back and listen to the first two episodes in this series. We've spent the last two episodes, roughly three hours, talking about the culture, the social pressures, the situation, the history, the tensions happening in Jerusalem, in Judea, for basically 170 years leading up to 30 Common Era. And I know 170 years seems pretty distant. How many people can remember a relative from 170 years ago? But the things that were happening 170 years ago have not yet resolved themselves inside Judea. And the things that have not yet resolved themselves is the cultural tensions around what it means to be Jewish. That's one cultural tension happening. And this is happening between different rival groups of Judeans within the countryside, within the nobility, within the city of Jerusalem even to an extent within the Sanhedrin, which is the leading kind of political body in Judea. By 30 Common Era, the Sanhedrin is mostly dominated by just one of these philosophical bodies of what it means to be Jewish. There are other groups still in and around the city. Some of them have completely abandoned the city and have moved out and started their own communities um, in basically the desert to get away from Judean religious authority and control in order to live their lives the way they think it should be in order to lead a proper Jewish life. So there's this tension has been happening and this has oftentimes in that 170 year period over these last two episodes resulted in violence, resulted in anger, discontent. It's expressed itself in terms of suppression of other groups. There's been civil wars because of some of these disagreements about what it means to be Jewish. And throughout that previous 170 year period, there was the rejection of the Greek-influenced uh, Seleucid control and influence on the civilization of Jerusalem and Judea and the surrounding population that weren't all part of Jerusalem. That took the form of violence against people that were accepting this Greek cultural influence, the love of Greek wine, Greek silverware, Greek pottery, Greek art, you know, all that sort of stuff. And the embracing of a development of uniquely Jewish and, or uniquely Judean wine, art, silverware, pottery. The imports dissolve. They're not there anymore in the archaeological record, replaced with local equivalents. So there is these two things happening this rejection and embracing of turning inward, defining themselves by being, you know, not Greek, not the other party. And the group that had been leading this for the last 170 years had been a group that I spent the entire last episode talking about, and that's the family of the uh, Maccabees, the heirs of Judas Maccabeus. They won their revolt against Seleucid, achieved a kind of semi-independence, and they were in a state of vassalhood, not vassalhood, that type of thing. And through the heirs of Judas Maccabeus, there was seesawing in that kind of thinking about what it means to be Jewish. Some people were oppressing some of these other groups, some of them were reconciling with them. They're negotiating. They're trying to figure out what it means to be Jewish, coming to some agreement over that. Sometimes that resulted in those civil wars I mentioned. Sometimes it resulted in peace. 
sometimes involve, uh, pardon me, involve people just leaving the community by the hundreds or thousands and doing their own thing elsewhere. So this had been happening over the previous 170 years, and it was still not fully resolved in about 60 before Common Era, and that's roughly when Pompey, the Roman consul, shows up with an army and kind of stamps his control, Roman control, over Syria and Judea and the surrounding countryside. Pompey appoints Herod the Great, who is a king of uh, Judea. He makes him king, ends the Maccabee line. Now Herod the Great marries into the Maccabee family to uh, provide some more kind of political authority to his appointment. Something local, not necessarily Roman or outside, which of course has been a significant problem of something it being outside the Judean population telling other Judeans how to act and be. This is the scenario going in towards 30 Common Era. Now everybody knows this is the time of Jesus of Nazareth, the kernel formation of what will become Christianity. This forms out of Jesus of Nazareth and his followers. They're one of these groups that are trying to figure out what it means to be Jewish, what it means to be properly Jewish. And Jesus of Nazareth is not the only figure that takes control and kind of claims to be a Messiah at this time. He's not unique to the scenario. We know in the written record that there are at least two other messianic Jewish figures that kind of come up from nowhere. They're not part of the nobility. And they seize the hearts and minds of thousands of Judeans from the countryside. Now, pardon my, I'm sure I'm going to mispronounce it, but his name is either uh, Thaddeus or Thudis or Theodis. He and his followers tried to uh, claim that he could lead his followers away from Roman control, and they attempted to uh, cross the River Jordan. He claimed he could part it with the power of God. That might sound familiar to you. There was another messianic figure known as the Egyptian, also kind of coming out of the desert with thousands of Judeans. And he actually marched up to the city of Jerusalem and believed with the power of God he could bring down the walls. Now the Romans obviously didn't like anybody claiming to be a king, and that's what they were doing. They were raising uh, people in rebellion. They were rejecting Roman authority. So the Romans promptly arrested them and did the exact same thing to them that they did to Jesus and anybody else who wasn't explicitly a Roman citizen who denied the godhood or kingship of Caesar. Crucifixion, death, that's what happened. And why these things are happening, it's not necessarily... Um, because of Rome, although Rome will become a trigger, and I'm going to talk about some of those triggers in just a moment, but those pressures that I've been talking about that have been happening for the last 170 years, these are leaving psychological scars on the Judean population. It's not resolved. It's not done. There are still lots of groups of people, some of them hundreds, thousands strong that do not agree with either Roman authority or the authority of those in charge of the Sanhedrin, one of those um, religious philosophical groups that I was talking about. Now, King Herod, 
he understands the danger crossing Rome represents. Herod had, prior to his um, appointment as king, worked and in the Roman administration, collecting taxes, um, working with the army, working with Pompey. He was close friends with Mark Antony. And when the civil war starts between uh, Mark Antony and Octavian, that's the adopted son of Julius Caesar, Herod, who's king, throws the support of Judea behind Mark Antony and Cleopatra. That certainly doesn't do a whole lot to earn his good graces with the Judean population, but that's what he did, and he was friends with Mark Antony. The army's literally right there. It's just on the doorstep. So you can support Octavian, who he's never met, who's, you know, a thousand miles away, or you can support the person you've been friends with for years who appointed you general and also has a giant army just a few miles away. Easy decision. That's what happened. Of course, it turns out he backed the wrong figure. And when Mark Antony and Cleopatra are defeated, Herod represent our understanding the danger that he's in and also the danger that the Judean countryside is in goes to Octavian and brings a giant pile of treasure with him and says, hey, my bad, I backed the wrong guy. But you can see I backed him because he appointed me king of Judea and I was faithful to him up until his death and now that he is dead I am swearing that I will be faithful equally faithful to you and here oh by the way here's a whole bunch of money well Octavian you know seeing a giant pile of cash in front of him and trying to rebuild a devastated Italian countryside accepts that yeah, you can stay king. I don't need to march my army over there. You just keep this money flowing towards Rome and we will be okay. And Herod, understanding the inherent danger of what Rome represents if he crosses them, duly keeps the money flowing towards Octavian, towards Titus, towards his heirs. And while he's doing that, he is fully embracing what it means to be Roman, importing Roman goods, building Roman temples, not in the city, but in the Judean countryside. He builds a port city, names it Caesarea. You know, Herod does a lot of building projects and works to integrate Roman culture into the Judean culture. Now, a lot of people are at least somewhat familiar. You've heard about the um, fortress at Masada. This will become the, la the famous last stand of the Judean revolt. But in the time of Herod the Great, it's a fortress out in the, in the city, or pardon me, out in the countryside. He built a palace inside this, and inside the palace... There is a beautiful combination of Judean mosaic art and Roman painting on the walls and floors. This is Herod, I think, in a very good nutshell, as somebody who is working to try and integrate Rome, Roman culture, Roman life with Judean culture, understanding the danger it represents if he does not. But still, Herod would have the memory of what would happen. He's from Idumea, which, of which his father would have been part of the generation that was utterly obliterated in the city during the uh, rule of the Maccabean dynasty. 
So he knows that there is a danger, an unresolved danger of not doing this Judean first policy. You know, we you can think, you know, Fortress America, you know, buy American, build American, you know, buy the Ford, buy the Chrysler, whatever that means. Judeans want that for Judea. Buy Judean, build Judean, don't import this other crap. Judean goods are good enough for everybody, and we don't need all this Roman crap. Herod is trying to get around that, but he's not being successful. And even though he, you know, Jerusalem is incredibly wealthy, even though he does a lot to keep Rome at bay, keep them distant, they're not dipping their fingers into the, into the noses of what's happening in Judea. Everybody can live their life. He's doing one thing to deal with the distant Romans, not understanding the what he's doing is ticking off that unresolved conflict that's still simmering just underneath the surface. After Herod dies, Rome breaks up the kingship. There's no more a king. There's what they call, I think it's called an ethnarch, who's the governor, the Judean governor, you know, the local governor of the countryside. And other parts of the Judean countryside are broken up and handed to other um, heirs or people closely related to the Judean ruling dynasty. And then a Roman governor is appointed to oversee everything. Of course, everybody, I think if you're at all familiar with the story of Jesus or you've seen the Passion of Christ, whether it's play, the movie, whatever that is, or you've read the New Testament, you are familiar with the Roman governor of Jerusalem, Pontius Pilate. We all know him as the guy who orders the crucifixion of Jesus. But Pontius Pilate is... Um, part of the, what would you call that? Um, the Roman guide to how to rule a countryside. He's a student of that school of thought. Rome is just learning about what it means to rule foreign nations. They've conquered the Italian countryside. They've just recently conquered Gaul, you know, within the last two generations. They've taken over chunks of Greece, the previous generation, which I talked about in my first episode. Rome has had about a generation or two to wrap their head around how to rule foreign powers. These aren't other Italians. They're different, completely different cultural groups with very alien ways of thinking. And so Rome over the last couple of generations has um, kind of adopted a policy of divide and conquer where, um, you know, just completely obliterating the rival population isn't something they want to invest in. They try this divide and conquer attitude. It worked very successfully for Caesar during his conquest of Gaul. It became the template for how to do things. And what they do is they find two rival powers within the countryside and try to play one off the other in order to distract them from the fact that Rome's actually the one in control. Pontius Pilate does this. He understands that there is a generational hatred between the people of Jerusalem and the people in Samaria. And I talked quite a bit about that hatred in the previous episode. We talked about John Hyrcanus, his two sons, Aristobulus and Antigonus, and their uh, harrying and complete and utter uh, obliteration of Samaria and the countryside around uh, Mount Carmel. 
So there is a generational hatred that's been hundreds of years going on. And Pontius Pilate likes to play this up in order to keep the uh, city of Jerusalem in line. In fact, he, uh, with you know, Judean support and Roman support, bullies the Sumerians so much they revolt. It actually uh, kind of one of the triggers for having him uh, removed as governor. He went too far, you know. W- you know when you're when you're going so far, the people are revolting. Rome's like, eh, I think think you're not doing it right. You know, we don't want them revolt. We want them playing off each other. Uh, but the, you know, the moment you you get them angry and we've got to send soldiers in, that's a problem. You're not doing it right. That's why Pontius Pilate is removed. But he was part of this uh, Roman uh, attitude towards how to manage these alien foreign nations because they couldn't wrap their heads around how to rule or get these people on board with what it means to be part of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire is still defining itself. You know, what the heck does it even mean to be part of the Roman Empire? And they figure out early on that... Uh, Jerusalem and Judeans and people who are part of the Jewish faith are something unique. Pontius Pilate is one of the peoples that that figures this out the hard way. When he's first appointed governor of Jerusalem, he brings the legionary standards inside the city, the eagle. This is seen or interpreted as an icon which the Jerusalem, the Jews in Jerusalem, you know, they cry out, they fall to the ground, they bear their throats, they would rather die than than stomach a Roman eagle being in the city. So Pontius Pilate removes the eagles from the city. He doesn't just slaughter the population. Octavian, you know, who was... you know, getting tons of money in the form of taxation and gifts from Herod, he actually declares a law that Judean customs and rituals surrounding their God must be respected. And I know, you you know, most people think of Romans as utterly cruel and thoughtless. and In a lot of cases, it's true. But soldiers who would, for example, insult the writing of Moses by ripping up or tossing them into a fire, they could easily be expected to be beheaded as punishment for that. So it's not to say that uh, individual Roman soldiers uh, weren't ignorant and didn't do stupid and cruel things, but the Roman authorities didn't hesitate to punish them with capital punishments for defying the law of Augustus. So there's a respect there that happens that started from the time of Herod the Great, and it continues through the time of Pontius Pilate. The Romans, even though there's these you know individual soldiers causing individual problems, the law of Octavian persists it's respected and it is enforced with capital level punishments for breaking that law if they do not respect the laws and customs of the judeans but roughly 30 years after the death of jesus of nazareth something significant changes the entire history of the world we're going to talk about that in just a moment Before I get to that um, major history-changing moment, I did want to just rewind time a a few years and just talk back uh, for a moment about some of this simmering cultural hatred that was bubbling up. We talked earlier about how I spent the last two episodes talking about these different groups of Jewish people who are philosophically trying to figure out what it means to be Jewish, that this erupted in several civil wars, in oppression, in torture, 
and sometimes reconciliation of some of these groups to the ruling family of the Maccabees or internally with each other. Talked about some of these groups that just washed their hands of everything and completely abandoned Jerusalem and went off and started their own communities. But this is still happening even as Rome is ruling the lands of Judea. One of these groups is called the Sicarii or Sicarii. I may be pronouncing that wrong, but what they are is these groups of Jewish people that are responding to everything with violence. They've had enough. They can't get their way. God is angry. We're all doomed. And the only way to fix this is to start killing people. We've had enough of trying to talk. It's not solving any problems. We have to get rid of the people that aren't leading a proper, clean, rightful life. These Sakari, they're part of the Jewish community. They're all over the place. They assassinate the high priest of Jerusalem in uh, 58 Common Era. So this is just a few years ahead of the start of the Roman or, or the Jewish Roman Civil War. And even as this is happening, they're in the countryside doing the same thing. They will pop up at community gathering events. You know, nobody can tell who they are. They're just dressed like everybody else, but they've got these small curved daggers. That's where they get the name. The daggers look like sickles. So yeah, that's kind of terrifying to think of. But they will pop out of the crowd and start slaughtering people if they think they're not leading the proper life or setting a proper example. They're not leading the Jewish life. They're too pro-Roman, maybe pro-Greek. That's happening all through this. And I talked earlier at the start about a couple of those uh, messianic figures that popped up earlier, just right around the same time Jesus of Nazareth showed up. But just a few years before the outbreak, right around the time that this high priest is assassinated by the Sakari, yet another messianic figure shows up. A man by the name of Jesus Ben Ananias, not to be confused with Jesus of Nazareth, who's been dead for 30 years, give or take. This guy, same thing, prophesizing the destruction of Jerusalem, the fall of Roman control, the Roman governor at the time. It's not Pontius Pilate. It's another guy by the name of uh, Lucius Albinus. He arrests Jesus Ben Ananias, tortures him, questions him, but finds out that he's, you know, he's not a leader of thousands of people like Jesus was, like the Egyptian was that I talked about earlier. Not a threat to Rome, so he just lets him go. Just a crazy old man is what he kind of comes to the conclusion of. No real followers, not a danger to Rome. This are things happening and this is just what's recorded you can imagine if these things are bubbling up within the city of jerusalem where roman authorities are this is happening all over the judean countryside but rome isn't really in touch with all that there's no roman garrison in jerusalem and there isn't one there because they've had fantastic relations with first Herod the Great and his family. They've built good relationship with the Sun Hadrian. That's the leading political body in the city of Jerusalem. And I talked a little bit earlier how that relationship worked. Herod the Great first loaded the Roman population, specifically Octavian and his heirs, with 
gifts and lots of taxes. Jerusalem is fabulously wealthy. Herod spent some of that money, well, a lot of that money, not only giving it to Rome, but also on construction projects in Jerusalem and in Judea, turning the countryside into this Roman-Judean fusion. And his heirs follow that as well. And the son Hadrian, when the Herodian line ends, and it's just Roman governors, the Sanhedrin still endorses this as well. Within the city of Jerusalem, the Sanhedrin has maintained the policy that the Herodian line dynasty had, and that is to appease Rome through sacrifices on behalf of Caesar. And when I say Caesar... That is not necessarily Julius Caesar. Caesar is what we would think of as the emperor. There is no such word as emperor in Roman and Judean culture and language. They're not using the word king. The word we think of as emperor at the time is called imperator. An imperator is a title that can only be gained by a Roman leader who has achieved a great battle and a great victory. So the Julio-Claudian line, these are the heirs of Octavian. They're not imperator. They're not wartime generals. So they haven't earned that title. But the title that they do have is called Caesar. So uh, when I say they give sacrifices on behalf of Caesar, that is what we would call, or what they would actually call, a gesture of loyalty. It's everywhere else in the empire, it's a sacrifice to Caesar. And when I say a sacrifice, it could mean, hey, you slaughter this lamb um, for the glory of Rome, or give an offering of some wealth, maybe wine, silverware, some grain, whatever that is. These are gifts offered up to Rome in the name of Caesar as a gesture of loyalty. This is something that is endor was endorsed by Herod the Great in his line, and it is endorsed and supported by the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of Jerusalem. They're not calling it sacrifices, and that gets around the Jewish laws around, you know, there is only one God. So this is still happening, and the Sanhedrin is endorsing this. There's good relationship between the Sanhedrin, that's the ruling council of Jerusalem, and Rome. And, Ro and it's not just a one-way extractive uh, relationship. There's actual examples of lots of Romans, some of them who are the heirs of Herod, who are fabulously wealthy, continuing to invest in uh, beautifying the Judean countryside and cities. There is also a Roman tax collector. This is not a Judean person. This is a Roman citizen, full-blown Roman appointed person who is a tax collector, an Arabarch in Egypt, specifically in Alexandria. He's fabulously wealthy and he donates piles of his wealth to gild the temple in Jerusalem. This is part of a culture of, what well, I don't know what you call it, what we would call it generosity would be maybe an appropriate term, but it's not of what Romans would call their dignitas. We know that word as dignity, but it means kind of like that, but so much more. It might be closer for us to think of dignitas as honor, honor and dignity and glory. 
combine all three of these things into one word, and you're kind of close to what dignitas means, but it is an extraordinarily important aim of every Roman citizen to maximize their dignitas. Doesn't matter how poor you are or how rich you are, you want to acquire this dignitas, and you can acquire it many ways. The main popular way to do it is through earning glory for Rome, and that would be winning battles, conquering people, taking wealth back, of course. That's a big part of earning your dignitas, but also being part of the Roman administration is another popular way to earn your dignitas. So that would mean taking part in the Senate, taking part in the courts, being a, a judge, a lawyer, a prosecutor, defense attorney, being somebody who helps oversee wills, being part of the, the gears that enable the culture and civilization of Rome to flourish. All these things can earn dignitas for you, as well as this dignitas moves forward, you inherit dignitas from your ancestors. So if your father was a Roman consul who'd uh, won a couple of great battles, you've already come into life with a hefty chunk of dignitas attached to your family name. But you can also earn and increase your dignitas through public improvements. That would mean funding temple construction, funding road construction, funding aqueducts, baths, um, libraries, that sort of thing. And Romans who are fabulously rich, and if you're a tax collector or you're a senator, you are at the ultra-wealthy level of the Roman citizen. And so they did invest quite a chunk of their money in these public acts of generosity. So instead of sending that money back to Rome and investing it in uh, you know, marble gilding for a temple or whatever that is, this uh, Roman tax collector in Alexandria instead donated that money and gilded the temple in Jerusalem as a way to increase his dignitas. That was an important achievement for him. So you can see, even though Rome is a very extractive empire, there are these individual acts of magnanimity that even though they're improvements of the public wealth are designed to help improve the image, the dignitas of a Roman family's name. That's happening too, even as all this stuff is going on. So you can see there is quite a complicated play of things tugging at the fabric of Judean society. There's Rome extracting wealth through taxes, through gifts and gestures of loyalty. They've taken away from Judea the line of kings, and several thousands of the population are probably very happy that either the Maccabee line or the Herodian dynasty are no longer kings. That's the way it should be. And then there are some that are not happy with that. They want the heirs of the Maccabee family put back in power, or they want the heirs of the Herodian line put back in power, or they don't want that at all. The wrong people are high priest. Maybe they're the right high priest. And in and amongst all this is this, this tension around what it means to be Jewish and who's leading the proper Jewish life versus not. This is still erupting in violence and acts of terror. And so you can see this thing that's been happening, and it's been going on for over a hundred years. What would that do psychologically to you living in this, knowing your grandparents were part of this, who maybe raised you as kind of one of these radical people? 
you know, the, 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 the head priest who's supposed to be the, the most religious authority, the person who's supposed to be leading the best life is wrong. You might have a feeling that your world is ending or coming to an end. And so these messianic figures are coming out of nowhere, acquiring at times thousands of followers, supporting their beliefs, supporting the end times, wanting to bring the end times into a action. This is all happening as we move in to that all important thing that's going to change history forever. And let's talk about that right now. In 64 Common Era, this is the time and reign of Roman Emperor Nero. The famous fire of Rome happened. And I know we think of Rome as a city of marble, stonework, statues, famous columns, that sort of thing. But at the time of Nero, Rome was mostly a lot of wood buildings, apartments, close-knit housing, you know, really compressed space for people to live in multi-story tenements a lot of it has no kind of building regulations on it so a fire happened and almost the entirety of the city of rome burned down the fire lasted for days burning the countryside you know like the famous fire of london that burned the city down and that lasted for days this happened in rome of course, the whole thing about Caesar fiddling on the roof, well, there's no fiddles at the time, but, uh, you know, Nero was actually out trying his best to uh, get the citizen together and um, set up camps and, you know, take care of things. This whole fiddling while Rome burned happened, that came later on from Nero's detractors, the senators who didn't like Nero's popularity with the everyday citizen but rome burned down the entire city burned down it's as devastating a thing that could have possibly happened and the outcome of this is a couple of things firstly uh jewish people were blamed for it when i say jewish people we would actually call that early christians it's one of the first uh, documented persecutions of christians whether or not it was an actual thing or just something that was later written about is actually up for debate. Some people say Nero and the Romans blamed early Christians for the fire, and so they were persecuted, banished from the city, there was murders, you know, a mob rule, that sort of thing. Other people say that's not what happened at all, and that's just a later writing by uh, early Christian authors trying to play up the hatred of Rome against Christians, you know, the persecution by Rome. So whether that happened or not, I, I don't know, and I'm not here to answer that question, but that's one of the stories that's out there that Christians, which were seen at the time as a sect of Jews, you know, I talked about those philosophical groups arguing, trying to figure out what it means to be Jewish, Early Christians at the time don't see themselves as Christian. They don't see themselves as a distinct group. They see themselves as Jewish people leading the proper Jewish life. There was this rumor of their persecution and the rumor that they caused the fire. But regardless of who did what or what that is, Nero's got an entire city to rebuild. That takes a lot of money. And Nero, even though being the emperor of Rome, is fabulously wealthy, he's not near wealthy enough to rebuild an entire city, not in short order. Especially since he'd given the entire land of Greece basically a tax-free living during his reign. 
So there's an entire giant province filled with thousands and thousands of rich people that are not being taxed by Rome. And now he's got an entire city to rebuild. So the money, the shortfall that would have come from Greece to help rebuild that, all the other provinces had to bear that burden. And at that same time, Nero appoints a brand new governor to Jerusalem to help assist with the extra taxation that's required to rebuild a city. That governor, man by the name of Florus, Gessius Florus, he's a friend of Nero's family, so he's got an uh, appointment you know, partly on the fact that he's a senator, but partly and probably mostly because he's a close friend of the family of Nero. He's sent to one of the richest provinces in Roman territories, Jerusalem, and he has one job. Get money out because we need to rebuild the city and there's an entire land of Greece which isn't paying the taxes that he was given the pass on. So Jerusalem has to help make up that shortfall. Jerusalem and Judea. That's Florus's sole job. Extract wealth. And so Florus ratchets up the taxation. And taxation is probably a nice way of saying... Uh, basically steal money and take whatever you can from wherever it is because whatever Caesar wants and when I say Caesar that's emperor whatever Caesar wants that's what Caesar gets so every year Florus is ratcheting up the taxes extracting as much wealth as possible and after two years of this, Florus comes up with a shortfall. He's not going to make his minimum tax amount that he has to send back to Nero. And so looking to make up the missing sum, he turned to confiscating money from the temple, the temple in Jerusalem. And I'm going to quote Tom Holland's PAX, the response from the population was, in quoting PAX now, outrage had blazed across the city. Rioters had taken to the streets, and Floris responded with savage reprisals. Given license to make the city flow with blood, the Samaritan garrison needed no second invitation. Over 3,000 people women and children, as well as men, had been cut down. From the lowliest peasant to the highest nobility, people were scourged and tortured to death. End quote. Now you can see here, if you're remembering earlier, we were talking about how Rome liked to play the Samaritans and the Judeans, Jerusalem people, off each other. We had the Roman governor Pontius Pilate got pulled out of his post because he had um, harassed, played the Judeans up so much against the Samaritans. The Samaritans rose up in revolt and a Roman garrison had to be sent to sort that out. Well, there isn't an actual Roman garrison there. Instead, Rome made the Samaritan population the garrison and put them in and around the city of Jerusalem. And I say garrison, it's not a full Roman garrison. They're not trained Roman ways. They haven't been in battles. These are local guys that have been given, uh, you know, the Roman pilum, the spear, the shield, and a Roman gladius, some armor. And then their job is just to walk around and make sure we're getting the taxes out. You don't need thousands and thousands of soldiers for that. You don't need a whole legion. So a small local garrison of Samaritans who are more than happy to do whatever they can to kind of pay back some of that pain that had been visited upon them earlier under Pontius Pilate, but also that pain that had been paid back even earlier than that 
under the Maccabee family who slaughtered the entire city of Samaria and then raped and burned the countryside of Mount Carmel. The Samaritans are having an opportunity to get back at the local population and try and make that karmic weights go back into balance. So they slaughter 3,000 people, men, women, and children, in order to put down the rioters taking in the street about trying the Romans taking the money directly out of the temple. Now, the Judean response to this, after the Samaritans and the Romans put down the riot, again, when I talked earlier about that push and pull on the fabric, some of them are responding with violence, some of them are trying to work with the Roman governors and the Roman control, the Roman authority. So some of the leadership wanted to appeal to the governor of Syria, who in the Roman hierarchy is actually the boss of Florus. Some of them wanted to send emissaries to Rome and appeal directly to Nero. Others thought this was feeble and cowardly. The militant faction, they're keen to ride the mood of insurrection that's in the city. They seize control of the temple. And a young priest there, a priest by the name of Eleazar, announced basically a declaration of war. Eleazar seized the temple with his militant crew and then banned everybody in the city from awarding gifts to any foreigners. This basically meant no more of those quote-unquote gestures of loyalty to Rome. This was, in effect, a declaration of war against Rome. If Rome's not getting their money voluntarily, they're going to take it involuntarily. That faction that's wanting to still work with Rome, they try, like I said send emissaries to Rome. We need to dial down the taxes. It's too much. Some of them sent emissaries to the governor of Syria. The same thing. Others organized a protest against the taxation to coincide with a scheduled visit of the governor of Syria to Jerusalem. And the population of Jerusalem and Judea, unfortunately for them, they don't understand that even though the governor of Syria is technically Florus' boss, Florus was appointed by Nero. And the governor of Syria is not going to overrule Nero. He's not going to go to Nero and say, Floris is the wrong guy to have here because every year Floris is making his number. And so even the population of Jerusalem and Judea that are trying to work within the Roman government to dial these taxes back and ease the pain, even they're falling on deaf ears. They're plight is not responding. The governor of Syria is technically powerless to do anything, assuming he would even want to do something. He has to extract taxes too and make sure that's all going back to Rome. And so here we are in 66 Common Era after the fire of Rome after the religious tensions are still not resolved, after terrorist groups are roaming the countryside, terrorizing populations that aren't living a proper Jewish life, 
after communities of Jewish people are leaving the countryside, forming their own communities, after the fall of two great dynasties, some of which were wanted by Judeans and some of which were not in wanted at all by Judeans, after the assassination of high priests, after the riots within the city, the slaughter of Jewish civilians by Samaritans, all these things have been pulling at the fabric of the Judean countryside, and the tension is finally too much. The fabric comes undone, it rips apart, and rebellion erupts. Into this world being torn apart is going to be one of our main characters in our for the rest of the series, and that is Yosef ben Metatayu. Yosef is better known to us as Flavius Josephus, but for now we're going to call him Yosef. Yosef is a high priest, or pardon me, not a high priest. He is an everyday priest. He's a member of the elite Jewish nobility. He's a member of the priestly family. He's actually a descendant through his mother of the previous Maccabee dynasty. So there's royal blood in his veins, along with the priestly blood in his veins through his father. Yosef is a extremely well-educated uh, priest, as most people would be if you were in the Jewish nobility. He had the responsibility of mediating legal disputes, overseeing construction projects, things along that line. And if you're interested, go back to episode one in this series. We talked at length about the jobs and duties of priests and high priests in Judean and Jewish culture. But he is well-educated. He's also, as I, we know, he's grown up in this era of conflicting philosophical schools of thought about what it means to be Jewish. And as part of his education, he is educated in several of these different schools of thought. For what reason? We don't know. Maybe it's to help assist with mediating legal disputes between these groups, to help understand anything about them, or maybe it's his own personal interest in just being an educated person. But he's educated in several of these different competing philosophical groups about what it means to be Jewish. He's educated in Jewish law. He understands Jewish rituals, what it means to lead a clean life, a purity life. He has to follow Jewish purity laws. As he's grown up, one of his first duties is to go to Rome and appeal to Nero and try to regain the freedom of some Jewish priests that have been imprisoned there. Why they're in prison, we don't know. Maybe they were part of that Christian persecution group that uh, I was talking about earlier, right after the fire of Rome. Maybe not, maybe so, who knows. And again, Christians aren't defining themselves necessarily as Christians at this point. They're Jewish people. They're one of these competing philosophical groups. He's sent to Rome as an emissary of Jerusalem to negotiate with Romans and Nero the freedom of some Jewish priests who are being held in captivity there. So as he's traveled across the Mediterranean through the Italian provinces and to Rome, he's had an opportunity to see firsthand just how massive the Roman machine is. He would have opportunity to see 
or at least probably not see, but he would have heard of the Roman games. He would have heard of the Roman exploits and devastation in Gaul. He probably would have heard some history or even educated himself prior to visiting Rome, the history of Nero's ancestors. So he would understand Octavian, Nero, Titus, Julius Caesar. He would know just how much of a devastating war machine Rome is. And he would see it firsthand. It's one thing to read about it. It's another thing to be there in the city and see it firsthand. The overwhelmingness of it compared to tiny little Jerusalem. And while he's there, he has that opportunity to see that. He returns to Jerusalem and he has sent to the province of Galilee formerly of Samaria to be the local priest there to help uh, oversee the priestly duties for that area. And he is there when the revolt breaks out. And we're going to talk about all of that, the actual revolt right up to the destruction of Jerusalem in my next episode.